Shutterstock Music. Good afternoon, all of you. It is my great pleasure to welcome Hida Pluch and all of you here this afternoon for a reinitiation of the Champalimau Concert Talks. For the time being, it's a slow kind of thing, but, uh, but live. <laughs> Three dimensional, <laughs> as, as they say these days. Um, so it's very nice that we take up this uh, series again. And it's particularly pleasant for me uh, to introduce Hida Pluch, who was kind enough to accept to come. He has already been here. Some of you have uh, heard him before. Hida um, uh, did his uh, PhD at, uh, at Harvard University with Jack Strominger on MHC structure. Um, then, uh, as he used to say, he never made a postdoc because he was recruited immediately for the University of Köln. Then, after some years, he was called to MIT. He entered MIT, he was there for several years. Then he moved to Harvard, and then back to MIT, and then back to Harvard again, where he's now in the uh, hospital for six children. Um, he, 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 he defines himself as a biochemist, but, uh, uh, but we know biochemists are modest, usually. So <laughs> he, he has used uh, his competences in biochemistry in a number of fields, in, in biomedical research, in immunology, in cell biology, in many things. And his contributions are many. I don't want to spend much time saying it. Um, I want to say one thing about Hide. Uh, he, he covers a lot of ground um, as a scientist. Um, and he, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, he asked me not to say many things, but I have to say this one. Uh, he's the, back, the best lecturer I know. Uh, I've heard it many times, and every instance I confirm that conviction I have. Uh, I, I'm not preempting anything, <laughs> but uh, uh, a good close friend of us used to say that he's such a good lecturer that he needs actually to have no data to give a fantastic talk, which is not the case, but, but he is a very good lecturer, and I'm sure that you'll all enjoy it as much as I. Hida, please. <clears throat> I might be a good lecturer, but I have to figure out how this thing works. <laughs> there we go. All right, 
Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think my last visit to Champalima was maybe three years ago. Um, and what we'll talk about today are applications of a set of tools that I've been obsessed with for the last decade or so. And these are nanobodies. I'll explain to you what nanobodies are and how we put them to use, both for diagnostics and for therapeutic applications. And the models that I'll use include inflammation, as exemplified by virus infections. And towards the end, I'll have uh, some things to say about cancer and how one might apply nanobodies for diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the individuals who are responsible for the work that I'll show. This is uh, a talented postdoc, Nova Pichesha, a French postdoc, Thibaut Armand, Xin Liu, Claire Carpenet, Jess Ingram, Mohamed Rashidian, Mike Dugan, Tao Feng, and Ryan Alexander. And we uh, have benefited from collaborations with colleagues at MIT and Harvard, notably Richard Hines and his postdoc, Noor Jalkani, and Jeff Lichtman at Harvard. And you'll see uh, how these folks participated. So what are nanobodies? Most of you uh, are surely familiar with the conventional structure of immunoglobulins, two identical heavy chains, two identical light chains. And it's through the variable regions of both heavy and light chains that these immunoglobulins recognize antigen. What is unusual is uh, a family of vertebrates, camelids, and these animals make not only the conventional two-chain immunoglobulins, but in addition, they make heavy chain only immunoglobulins. And this was a serendipitous discovery by undergraduate students in a laboratory course in Belgium in 1993. And uh, the Belgians, of course, have uh, made huge contributions to this particular area. Thankfully, the patent on nanobodies expired in 2013, and this has catalyzed a massive explosion of applications of nanobodies. So what are these nanobodies? They're essentially the variable region of the heavy chain of these heavy chain only antibodies. They're about 15 kilodaltons in size and they're the smallest immunoglobulin derived fragments that still recognize antigen with affinities that are comparable to uh, those of conventional immunoglobulins. Their small size is an obvious advantage and I'll show some of the advantages later on uh, because they have uh, superior tissue penetration their small size means they're rapidly cleared from the circulation, thus avoiding systemic exposure. But perhaps importantly to the biochemist, uh, it's the ease of expression. You can make these nanobodies in E. coli. You can ship plasmids to your friends, and anyone who can produce a protein in E. coli can make gram quantities of these nanobodies. As I'll show in a moment, uh, they're also easily modified to equip them with payloads and functionalities of interest. And this is something that my lab has been uh, interested in for the past decade or so. Importantly, if one considers application of nanobodies for use in the clinic, they are poorly immunogenic. As it turns out, the variable regions of these heavy chain only antibodies are highly homologous to the VH3 family of human immunoglobulin variable regions. And that means that they are indeed readily uh, infusible into patients without provoking an immune response. And, in fact, the first product is uh, clinically approved to treat a clotting disorder. Their small size uh, means that they are almost ideal tools for imaging, which requires high affinity, short circulatory half-life, and good tissue penetration. And these are all properties that these nanobodies uh, possess. So I've shown you a list of uh, the collaborators in my lab who uh, are responsible for most of the work. But these are the two uh, prime characters. The, these are the first alpacas that we use for immunisa immunization, Bryson and Sanchez. And many of the antibodies that we work with come from these uh, two cute little guys here. So how does one make nanobodies? Uh, we practice what we call multiplex immunization. So we have a herd of some two dozen alpacas in Western Massachusetts where they live on a very pleasant farm. We immunize them with a mixture of antigens and uh, having established that an immune response against the immunogens has occurred, we harvest peripheral blood. From this blood, we harvest the uh, mononuclear cells and then using primers uniquely specific for the variable regions of these heavy chain only immunoglobulins, we can amplify selectively the variable regions of these heavy chain only antibodies. The amplified product is then cloned in a phage display vector 
such that uh, at the tip of the phage, a fusion protein exists that includes the nanobody so that we can use these phage to select on uh, immobilized antigen those nanobodies of interest. And even though we can immunize one animal with up to two dozen different antigens, one can, of course, deconvolute the resulting library by screening on individual purified proteins that have been immobilized. And in this fashion, we can greatly economize on the use of animals. Uh, one alpaca can be bought for $250 in the US. A non-castrated, misbehaving male is uh, to be had for free. Uh, it's not without its problems. Uh, but in any case, this is uh, a very cost-effective way of making high-quality uh, immunological reagents. The expression can be done in E. coli or in mammalian cells, and like I said, uh, yields of tens of milligrams per liter are not, uh, not exceptional uh, at all. So the following slide shows a short list of nanobodies that we commonly use in the, in the laboratory, and they cover most of the markers of immunological interest, uh, CTLA-4, PD-L1, class 2 MHC, uh, you name it. And this list continues to expand. By mining the patent literature where the sequences of these nanobodies are disclosed, one can easily synthesize gene blocks and then for laboratory use express nanobodies of interest in the uh, appropriate quantities. And, and you'll show some, I'll show some examples uh, along the way. Now, one of the mainstays in my laboratory is a chemoenzymatic transformation of these nanobodies which allows us to install on each nanobody site-specifically and in absolutely quantitative yield any payload of interest. So what you see in this slide is a target protein of interest. In our case, of course, this would be a nanobody. And by simple genetic modification, we install at the C-terminus of each individual nanobody a short sequence, LPXTG in single letter code. And this motif is recognized by a bacterial enzyme called Sortase A. Sortase A is usually exploited by gram-positive bacteria to attach proteins to the growing cell wall. An example is protein A. Many of you are familiar with protein A to purify immunoglobulins. That protein A is attached to the staphylococcal cell wall using exactly the reaction that I diagram here. So this Sortase A enzyme cleaves between the uh, threonine and glycine residue within that five residue motif with concomitant formation of a covalent thioacyl enzyme intermediate that's shown in the middle. And if one now feeds this reaction with a short synthetic peptide comprised of a few glycine residues to which one may affix any payload of interest, a transacylation reaction occurs that results in the formation of a perfectly good peptide bond via which this payload of interest is now attached to the C terminus of the nanobody. And I want to emphasize once again that this reaction is absolutely site-specific. There are no side reactions unlike malayamide chemistry popular in big pharma. The reaction proceeds with near 100% yield. And uh, the final products are easy to purify. And if any of you were interested, I'd be happy to discuss uh, some of the details. Now, as to the signature advantages of nanobodies, one of which is improved tissue penetration, I'll show you one experiment that shows a head-to-head -head comparison of a nanobody specific for a fluorescent protein and a monoclonal conventional antibody specific for that very same protein. We took mice that express YFP, yellow fluorescent protein, under the control of the Thi1 promoter, so uh, every single neuron in the brain will express YFP. We prepared tissue sections from these mice and then stain them either with a nanobody that recognizes yellow fluorescent protein or a conventional uh, antibody. And this is the result. Uh, in red is the stain of the immunological reagent, either the nanobody or the full-sized immunoglobulin. Uh, in green, the uh, staining pattern seen for yellow fluorescent protein. And in yellow, the overlap between the two stains. And as you can see in this section, which spans about 100 microns in thickness, the nanobody penetrates up to 50 microns deep in this uh, mildly fixed tissue. The full-size immunoglobulin barely penetrates beyond one micron. So using these types of reagents, uniquely modified at the C terminus with fluorophores of interest, together with Jeff Lichtman, we undertook the reconstruction of a section of brain. Having nanobodies specific for microglia, astrocytes, blood vessels, we could arrive at a high-resolution 3D reconstruction 
of neurons, microglia, astrocytes, and blood vessels in situ. And this is not a trivial task by conventional immunochemistry. So this is a 3D rendition of such a reconstruction where one can now for the first time explore uh, the morphology of astrocytes, microglia, uh, with all their uh, extremities in unprecedented resolution. This is a technique called correlative light electron microscopy. So the reconstructions are based on the electron micrographs. The identification of each individual cell is based on the use of a particular nanobody. And what you'll see in uh, purple are neurons uh, where we can see and, and have preserved the uh, structure of synaptic vesicles, the nerve terminals, postsynaptic densities. We can observe microglia in the process of pruning synapses in these sections. So this is a technology that we think uh, affords improved resolution compared to the standard methods common uh, in the field. So this is one application. Now for the remainder of my talk, I'll speak about manipulating immune responses for a variety of purposes, and you'll see some applications of nanobodies in that context. So the central theme is this very complicated slide divided in a left portion and a right portion. The left portion uh, specifies what happens under inflammatory conditions, and the right portion what happens under non-inflammatory conditions. The blue cell in the center is a professional antigen presenting cell. It could be a dendritic cell, but any class two MHC positive cell will fit the bill. And we hypothesize that if it were possible to target antigens specifically to these antigen presenting cells, we could improve immune responses, both in terms of eliciting a desirable immune response, as is the case for vaccination, as well as suppressing unwanted immune responses, as would be the case for autoimmune disease. So let's start with uh, a vaccine-based approach. And not surprisingly, my lab, like uh, everybody else under the sun, became interested in SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. And the idea here is that uh, the antigen-presenting cell, which constitutively expresses class II MHC products, can be targeted by uh, producing a nanobody that recognizes class II MHC products. And to that nanobody, we attach the antigen of interest. The idea is that the antigen presenting cell will now acquire this adduct between nanobody and antigen, process it uh, into class II peptide MHC complexes, which then allow activation of the appropriate helper T cells. And these helper T cells are obviously important in assisting B cells to produce high affinity antibodies. Moreover, these antigen-presenting cells can also trigger CD8-positive, class 1 MHC-restricted uh, cytotoxic T cells. So our assumption has been that by specific delivery of antigen to these professional antigen-presenting cells, we can trigger both class 1 MHC and class 2 MHC-restricted responses. So in these boxes are the key events that I've just tried to summarize. Step one is to deliver to these antigen-presenting cells an adduct composed of a nanobody to which we attach the antigen of interest. This adduct will be internalized, processed, and turned into class II MHC peptide complexes, step two. And this would assist helper T cells in their activation. And step three would be a similar type of response, but now focused on CD8 positive class I MHC restricted uh, T cells. So the idea here is to not use a virally vectored vaccine. Uh, today's news in the newspaper was that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is no longer approved for use except in unusual circumstances because they use an adenoviral vectored uh, preparation. What we propose instead is a purely protein-based preparation uh, with no replicating entity, no nucleic acids, and still achieving the same, same goal. So our VHH7 is an example of a nanobody that recognizes mouse class II MHC products. It does so without distinguishing between the various allelic products. So we can use this across a wide uh, variety of genetically disparate strains. And using the sortase reaction that I've explained to you, we can affix any antigen of interest to the C-terminus of this particular nanobody. And what we have done is to perform a head-to-head -head comparison of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 immunized in the presence of a conventional adjuvant in comparison with 
our nanobody antigen adduct. And what you'll see in this slide here on the left is the immunization scheme. So uh, two weeks before uh, the second injection, uh, a first antigen is delivered. Two weeks after the last injection, we harvest a small sample of blood and measure antibodies. And the three conditions contained on this slide are animals that receive adjuvant only, the black dots, the spike protein in the presence of conventional adjuvant, the blue dots, and in red, the uh, MHC class two vectored vaccine, if you will. And what is immediately obvious is that the total titers of circulating immunoglobulins are vastly increased when we deliver the vaccine preparation directly to antigen presenting cells. Uh, this is shown as a dilution series on the top right and endpoint titers at day 14 on the bottom right. We can also show that these vaccine preparations induce a higher degree of class switch recombination. So as you may recall, a B cell response starts with the production of IgM and as the response matures and somatic mutations occur, class switch recombination takes place as well. And what is particularly important for mucosal protection is the presence of IgA, the class of IgA immunoglobulins. And as the uh, diagram on the bottom of this slide shows, uh, for every single isotype that we can measure specifically, the vector preparation outperforms uh, spike with adjuvant alone. And importantly, we can of course take synthetic peptides that span the entire sequence of the spike and ask which of these peptides succeed in eliciting interferon gamma production by CD8 positive T cells. And once again, uh, spike protein delivered with adjuvant only is comparatively poor at eliciting a CD8 T cell response. But if we deliver the antigen in our class two specific format, we see vastly uh, improved responses uh, in terms of interferon gamma production by CD8 T cells. And perhaps the key experiment, of course, is does this preparation afford protection in vivo? So we use these famous ACE2 transgenic mice. They can be infected with SARS-CoV-2. And if infected, the uh, sequence of events kills the mouse. As you'll see on the left, uh, a Kaplan-Meier type plot for animals that received adjuvant only, adjuvanted spike or our class two targeted preparation only the animals that receive the class two targeted preparation survive and do not sustain weight loss. Uh, in the other cases, the animals do much worse. And uh, even animals that receive adjuvanted spike do not uh, control the infection. So this is an example of uh, how we can use nanobodies to specifically deliver antigen to antigen presenting cells. I am suggesting that this application is not necessarily limited to eliciting uh, virus specific responses. We think that this can also work for tumor specific responses, some of which we've published. I'd like now to temporarily flip to the other side of the coin, which is the ability of nanobodies to impose antigen specific non responsiveness, tolerance. So that's the right side of the cartoon that I already showed. Here the idea is to deliver antigens implicated in autoimmune disease under non inflammatory conditions. And the immunological canon would have you believe that if you present antigen via dendritic cells under non-inflammatory conditions, profound non-responsiveness is the outcome. So we will test that. So the model that we use is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, a condition called experimental autoimmune encephalitis. And it is induced in mice by administration of a toxic cocktail of myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein in the presence of complete front adjuvant and helped a little bit by a whiff of pertussis toxin to loosen up the blood-brain barrier. Seven days after administration of, um, I should, some 30 days after administration of this toxic mix, the animals develop clinical signs of disease, ranging from limp tail all the way to complete paralysis. And the question we had is, can we somehow intercept this disease by providing uh, the implicated antigen under non-inflammatory conditions. So what you see on the left of this slide is the experimental setup. Seven days prior to administration of this toxic mix, we give a single dose of 20 micrograms of a nanobody to which we've attached the offending self-antigen, this myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein fragment. 
And then one week later, we induce disease and watch what happens. The interventions consist of a nanobody of the appropriate specificity, but with the wrong antigen, a nanobody of the wrong specificity with the correct antigen, and the combination of an anti-class 2 nanobody with the offending self-antigen MOG. And as the cartoon on the right shows, only animals that receive the appropriate nanobody conjugated to the appropriate antigen are completely refractory to induction of disease. This resistance is persistent. Uh, having established this state of non-responsiveness, we can come back a few weeks later and try again to induce disease. Animals, once rendered resistant to induction of disease, remain completely refractory to induction of EAE. You might say, you know, this is not fair. Patients don't show up in the doctor's office expecting to become sick. Patients show up when they're symptomatic. So the question then becomes, can we intervene in animals that are already symptomatic? And this is where the inflammatory part comes in. The disease, of course, requires that the blood-brain barrier be damaged. There is inflammation. There is cytokine production. And you might say, if you add to this situation more antigen, targeted to antigen-presenting cells, wouldn't that be like adding fuel to the fire? And the answer is yes. If you do that, uh, if you treat symptomatic animals with the cocktail that I've just described, some 30 to 40 percent of the animals will proceed to develop what's called a cytokine storm, and they will die. So there is a way to address this, and this is by providing, at the same time, an immunosuppressive drug, for example, a corticosteroid like dexamethasone. So we have opted for targeted delivery of dexamethasone to the very same cells implicated in triggering uh, pathology. It is chemically possible for us to make dexamethasone derivatives that we can attach to nanobodies in exactly the same type of reaction that I've already shown you. So what we'll do next is to co-administer a nanobody that delivers the offending self-antigen together with a nanobody that targets those very same antigen-presenting cells, but now delivering dexamethasone. And I can tell you that the effects we observe would require orders of magnitude higher concentrations of free dexamethasone for similar effects. So here's the result. We first induce disease, uh, and then on the far left you'll see a series of animals that we started treating when they had reached stage one of this condition, which is limp tail. Co-administration of the nanobody and self-antigen together with nanobody dexamethasone adducts completely arrests disease progression. In the middle, we can take animals that have reached stage two, which is hind limb paralysis. We see a complete arrest in progression, and the symptoms even improve. These animals typically go from stage two to stage one. Animals that show complete hind limb paralysis, stage three, can also be treated, and we see arrest in disease progression. So even symptomatic animals can be treated with this approach, provided one delivers not only the offending self-antigen, but also an immunosuppressive molecule at the same time. And I repeat, the concentrations of dexamethasone that we deliver are about 200 to 1,000 fold lower than what we would typically use in the clinic to achieve immune suppression. And that benefit accrues mostly, we believe, because we can specifically deliver the drug to the cells implicated. Of course, we're interested in the mechanisms that might underlie this profound state of non-responsiveness. Uh, there's a lot of mechanistic work ongoing, but one example, there's an immunoinhibitory molecule called LAG3, uh, certainly known to the tumor immunologist amongst you. If we perform the same experiment in LAG3 deficient mice, we fail to establish complete tolerance. So there is implication that some of these inhibitory molecules are important. The ability to intercept autoimmune disease is not limited to this one condition, which is a polyclonal T-cell disease. There's an accelerated model of type 1 diabetes in which one takes T-cells from a T-cell receptor transgenic mouse, BDC 2.5. These T-cells recognize an antigen displayed on the uh, beta cells of the pancreas, the source of insulin. And the epitope recognized by these particular T cells has been identified. There's a synthetic peptide that mimics the epitope seen by this particular transgenic uh, T cell. 
If one activates these transgenic T cells ex vivo and then transfers them into a diabetes prone recipient, the so called NOD mouse, these animals will develop hyperglycemia like clockwork. By day eight, they're all hyperglycemic. So in this case, we do exactly the same thing. We transfer in our activated BDC 2.5 T cells, expecting that these animals will become hyperglycemic. A day later, we intervene either with the nanobody that targets class two, conjugated to the MOG peptide, the one that I used in the preceding experiments, or we use the nanobody conjugated to the appropriate peptide epitope recognized by these BDC 2.5 T cells. And as the graph on the right shows, uh, delivering phosphate buffered saline or the wrong antigen, these animals indeed become hyperglycemic, every single one of them. Animals that receive the uh, telogenic mix, as we call it, remain normal glycemic for as long as we observe these animals. This is a third model. I will not show you the data for that, but in the Balb sea mouse, there's an arthritis model that operates pretty much according to the same principles. We see exactly the same result. So we believe it is possible to intervene in the uh, onset or severity of autoimmune disease through interventions of the type that I've just discussed. I'll return to the uh, infectious disease models and inflammation in a little bit, but I'd like to turn to a different uh, imaging modality, uh, which will then allow me to, to turn back to uh, the story at hand, which will finish with cancer. I've pointed out that these nanobodies are small, they have a short circulatory half-life, and that is exactly what an ideal in vivo imaging agent would require. So the method that we've uh, pursued is positron emission tomography, a clinically useful and relevant method. There are three isotopes of interest to the uh, radio, radio chemist. F18, commonly used because fluorodeoxyglucose is of course used in the clinic, as you know, to detect metastases. Any metabolically highly active tissue can be visualized using F18 labeled fluorodeoxyglucose. It's commercially available, which is a huge advantage, but this half-life is 110 minutes and that poses severe challenges for synthesizing these imaging agents. On the far left, zirconium 89, half-life 3.3 days, positron yield much worse but at least it has a half-life that the biochemist can easily work with, and in the middle, copper 64. And we use, in fact, all three isotopes depending on the needs of the day. The use of FDG is, I think, particularly interesting because we've developed a method that allows us to explore, exploit commercially available fluorodeoxyglucose to label proteins, again, in a site-specific manner. The biochemist amongst you may appreciate the fact that glucose exists in the cyclical form and in the linear aldehyde form. The linear aldehyde form can participate in what's called an auxine ligation, and this allows us to install a tetrazine moiety on the uh, linear version of glucose. The tetrazine uh, modified FDG reacts with a structure called a transcyclooctene, which is non-radioactive, chemically stable, and we can use our sortase reaction to modify our nanobodies with this transcyclooctene moiety. And by now simply mixing the tetrazine modified FDG with our TCO modified nanobody, within 20 minutes at neutral pH, we get a site specific modification of a protein with an F18 label. And organic chemists will tell you that you know, the synthesis of carbon and fluorine bonds is one of the most challenging things that you can undertake. And given the short half life of the F18 isotope, it was particularly important for us to uh, establish a method that was both fast, reliable, and affordable. So we validate our uh, PET imaging experiments using a variety of tools, some of which are genetic. I'll show you one surprising result. Uh, we made an anti-PDL1 nanobody, labeled it with F18, and much to our surprise, discovered that the main target tissue decorated with the anti-PDL1 nanobody is brown adipose tissue. So tumor biologists don't usually think of PDL1 as a target that's expressed on anything else but uh, tumor cells, but it is in fact uh, a molecule that is probably important for metabolic control. And because of the availability of PDL1 knockout mice, we can perform a PET imaging experiment in either wild type animals and in the knockout. And of course, the signal that is unique to the wild type animal is what we consider the specific signal. That's how we inferred. Uh, the presence of PDL1 on brown adipose tissue. 
So we use these genetic controls to validate the specificity in vivo of our nanobodies. And this brought us to uh, a model of inflammation induced by a virus infection. And you'll see why th this, this was amusing to us uh, at first. So you see a large number of mice here on this checkerboard scheme. The 12 on the left are animals that are not infected with influenza virus. The 12 animals on the right are infected with influenza virus. And as an indicator of inflammation, we were interested in recruitment of neutrophils to the infected lung. You'll see VHH21, this is the top row on this slide. This is a neutrophil-specific nanobody. And as you compare the images acquired at various time points after administration of the imaging agent, you'll see that there is massive accumulation of neutrophils in the lung of the infected mice. The top row, the four mice uh, on the right. In the middle, we have a nanobody that decorates the flu hemagglutinin as evidence for virus infection. Uh, the signal is much weaker because probably there's much less of the antigen present. And the bottom row uh, indicates the animals that received an imaging agent that is nonspecific. It recognizes a parasite antigen uh, that is absent from these mice. The six little postage stamps at the bottom compare uninfected mice on the top, infected mice on the bottom, but now we show a blow up of the mid thoracic region to highlight the differences in signal. And as is obvious, the infected mice show massive accumulation of neutrophils in the lungs. We can detect the presence of the viral hemagglutinin, the middle panels, only in infected mice, and our nonspecific controls give no signal at all. So just taking a page from the playbook of this autoimmune experiment, this intervention that I showed you for the AE model, the question was, can we now target an anti-inflammatory drug to neutrophils that infiltrate the lung to uh, alleviate the symptoms that accompany a flu infection. So first of all, we showed that this VHH21, which is specific for a protein called LY6C and LY6G, uh, whether this indeed arrived at the appropriate destination. And this is, in essence, an experiment that confirms what I showed you in the preceding slide. On the far left, you see a mouse that was not infected with flu. There are, of course, some neutrophils in the lung because in the course of natural exposure to environmental pathogens, neutrophils reside there. But upon deliberate infection of the mice with influenza virus, you see a massive accumulation of this particular imaging agent in the lungs. So if we now replace the radioisotope with an immunosuppressive drug, can we see a therapeutic benefit? So this is the schematic of the experiment. On the top, you see the synthesis of our nanobody dexamethasone adduct. In the middle row, the biochemical characterization by liquid chromatography and mass spectroscopy of what we produce. And the bottom panel show you the weight loss curves for influenza virus infected mice. On the left, you see animals that receive either nothing, the black symbols, or a class two targeting nanobody conjugated to dexamethasone. In the middle panels, you see uh, the comparison of neutrophil-specific nanobodies conjugated with dexamethasone, and they strongly suppress the weight loss that normally accompanies a flu infection. On the far right, if you simply mix the components or give the nanobodies by themselves. So not only in this model of autoimmune disease can we combat inflammation by co-delivery of an immunosuppressive drug, we can also do this in the context of infectious disease. And that brought us to another idea of perhaps exploiting these nanobodies uh, to fight infectious disease. So in addition to the nanobodies that target surface molecules, we also have nanobodies that recognize the kappa light chain of immunoglobulins. And in the mouse, of course, 98% of circulating immunoglobulins are bearing kappa light chains. And we wondered whether if we could make a fusion or somehow modify the anti-kappa nanobodies with an agent that recognizes the pathogen specifically, would it now be possible to recruit polyclonal immunoglobulins to the virus-infected cell? So as you see on the top, the uh, adduct composed of anti-kappa and some anti-pathogen-specific component will bind to circulating immunoglobulins. The pathogen-specific component will seek out the infected cell. And by virtue of the fact that polyclonal immunoglobulins are attracted to the infected cells, we hypothesize that complement activation will occur. Natural killer cells and FC receptor positive cells will be attracted to the infected cell, 
resulting in killing. And although we haven't yet shown this, we believe that this may elicit what's called a vaccinal effect because the infected cell will release all its component parts. These will be acquired by antigen presenting cells and this will then help, help jumpstart a subsequent immune response. So this is how we did it. Uh, there's a small molecule called zanamivir. Uh, it's a neuraminidase inhibitor, uh, oseltamivir, tamiflu. These are all drugs in the same category. These small molecules recognize the influenza virus neuraminidase, and we made conjugates composed of a nanobody that recognizes kappa with this small molecule zanamivir. And so we hypothesized that this adduct would successfully identify neuraminidase positive, that is to say virus infected cells, recruit polyclonal Ig and uh, result in killing. So this requires some chemical ingenuity. There are six steps involved, starting with zanamivir to create an adduct that we can infect ligate to our nanobody of interest. And I showed this particular slide not to impress on you the details of the organic synthesis, but to point out that even though some of these things seem trivial, they nonetheless require a fair amount of fine tuning in the laboratory to get to where you want to be. Now, most of the vaccines that are flu specific deal with the A strains of influenza specifically. They don't usually cover the B strains unless one produces a cocktail that comprises both components of A and B strain influenza viruses. Zanamivir is interesting because it binds to neuraminidases of all strains of flu, regardless of whether they're strain A or strain B, and resistance is very rare. Uh, because the virus relies on neuraminidase for release of new particles, it cannot afford to mutate the active site too much without loss of activity. And zanamivir is a drug that exploits that very specific active site. So here's the result. Uh, a single shot at three milligrams per kilogram will protect mice against a 10 times LD50 of live influenza virus for both strain A and strain B. So this is uh, a cocktail that would provide lasting protection as long as the immunoglobulins persist in the circulation. These preparations are expected to be uh, effective. So this then raises the question, could one exploit this also for eliminating tumor cells? If you had a component that is specific for a tumor cell, can you then exploit this very same principle, eradicate tumor-specific, uh, uh, tumor-bearing targets? So we simply replace zanamivir with an anti-tumor entity and then go through the same schematic. So although we have yet to prove that this works in vivo, we have uh, made adducts of our anti-class 2 nanobody, the one that I've introduced to you on multiple occasions, fused it to the anti-kappa, and then asked, would this eliminate class 2 MHC positive cells in vivo? And as luck would have it, we have a mouse that has uh, a class 2 GFP knock-in, so every single class 2 MHC positive cell is green fluorescent. We inject our adduct composed of anti-kappa and uh, anti-class 2. And what you see here in the bottom panel is a stark reduction already with, within 24 hours after injection of all class 2 positive cells. These histograms depict, uh, you see two, two peaks basically, GFP positive uh, cells on the right indicated by these brackets, GFP negative cells on the left, those would be T cells, neutrophils, and so forth. And uh, no treatment, of course, the GFP positive cells persist. If you simply mix the two nanobodies without physically connecting them, no impact on class II positive cells. But if you make this conjugate, you see this drastic repression of class II positive cells. So we strongly suspect that this will be uh, achievable for tumor cells as well. And then let me finish with a section on how we image these events and then uh, return to what I think is a very encouraging sign that we have, in fact, markers that might lend themselves to uh, feeding into this particular scheme. So we've developed nanobodies for imaging of CD8 T cells, and it turns out that they require some chemical modification to acquire crisp images. What you see on the left are mice that are imaged with unmodified nanobodies in the far left. You can see the thymus and the lymph nodes barely visible. But if we modify these uh, nanobodies chemically by installation of a polyethylene glycol extension, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio improves dramatically. And these are, I would argue, the best PET-CT images that you'll ever see of CDA T cells in a mouse. 
We can then use this particular technology to image what happens in tumor models. So, of course, CDA T cells infiltrate tumors. That's one of the mechanisms by which we hope they are ultimately eradicated. Different tumors are visited by CDA T cells to varying degrees. Some tumors are cold, some tumors are hot. And as you'll see in this example, uh, both for the B16 tumor and for a pancreatic tumor derivative called PANC-O2, we can clearly see the accumulation of CDA T cells in the tumor and increased presence of CDA T cells in the draining lymph nodes. What is nice about positron emission tomography, it is a quantitative method. You can quantitate the amount of radioactivity for each voxel uh, in the final image. And this allows one to create maps of the distribution of CDA T, cell, CDA T cells within these tumors. And without going into too much detail, this is being published, by the way, one can show that the response of a tumor to immunotherapy correlates very nicely with the distribution of CDA T cells within that tumor. So there's a therapeutic intervention called GVAX, GMCSF, um, and uh, a cytokine um, and irradiated B16 tumor cells. If these irradiated cells are co-delivered with this GMCSF, uh, that preparation has vaccine efficacy against the B16 tumor. Depending on the dose delivered, some animals will respond and some animals will refuse to respond. And it turns out that these PET images can stratify quite accurately responders and non-responders. The responders shown on the top show homogeneous penetration of the tumor by CDA T cells. The non-responders shown on the bottom never achieve this homogeneous distribution. The CDA T cells are present, but they are distributed heterogeneously throughout the tumor. So this is in the B16 model in response to this GFAX strategy. Checkpoint blocking antibodies like anti-PD-1 are effective in a colon cancer model, and we see in essence exactly the same thing. In the absence of treatment, the three PET images on the left, we see this heterogeneous distribution of CDA T cells in the tumor. Animals that do receive PD-1 treatment, anti-PD-1 treatment and that respond quickly achieve near homogeneous distribution of CD T cells throughout the tumor, and this correlates with survival and control of tumor growth. Uh, this is the colon cancer model, exactly the same story. And importantly, one can intervene with the trafficking of lymphocytes by intervention with certain drugs. So this compound FTY720 is a drug that precludes egress of lymphocytes from lymph nodes. The only T cells that participate in the reaction are those that were present at the time we uh, started treatment. And this experiment, in essence, shows that the arrival of new T cells from the periphery is essential to achieve uh, tumor control and homogeneous distribution of CD T cells uh, within the tumor. Cells of monocytic lineage show similar behavior. In this case, we have, again, the PD-1 treatment model. We apply amounts of antibodies such that we have a cohort with partial responders and complete responders. On the left, you see the example of CD11B positive cells distributed in complete responders. On the right, the same experiment, but now a non-responder. We can use this as a prospective diagnostic criterion. In those animals that show heterogeneous distribution, we will never see a successful control of the tumor, and the opposite is true as well. So this allows us to prospectively identify responders and non-responders, extract CD45 positive cells from the tumor, and subject them to single cell RNA sequencing. And if you look at the far right first, you see that these famous TISNI plots, as they're called, this multivariate statistical approach to deconvolute complex patterns of transcriptional profiles, they allow a near complete uh, and perfect segregation of responders and non-responders. And if one asks, what are the cell types that correlate best with uh, responders and non-responders, perhaps not surprisingly to you, it's the M1 type macrophage that predominates in responders and the M2 type macrophage that predominates in the non-responders. So we think that these methods, uh, imaging in conjunction with single cell RNA sequencing, help us identify prognostic factors that may predict outcome of uh, therapy. 
Now, what's particularly uh, exciting to us and perhaps to some of you as well with the new pancreatic cancer center down the road is the fact that there are markers that might be useful for detection of uh, pancreatic cancer and more specifically preneoplastic lesions. And this is uh, a nanobody that recognizes the E3B splice variant of fibronectin. This was a nanobody that we developed together with Richard Hines. And this splice variant is uniquely confined to tumor stroma and the neovasculature. And in this particular experiment, we show that in the B16 model, having a nanobody that recognizes this splice variant specifically, we can detect metastases of the B16 melanoma. If one injects these B16 cells intravenously, they metastasize to the lung. And as the mouse on the left shows, we can clearly reveal the presence of these metastases in lung tissue. In an orthotopic transplant, heterotopic transplantation model, we can place the tumor on one of the uh, hind legs. And again, the only signal that pops up is that of the, um, the tumor. But most importantly, uh, and this is taken directly from uh, our joint publication with the Heinz lab, by PET imaging and also by conventional immunohistochemistry, we can reliably detect panin lesions uh, as the preneoplastic precursors to pancreatic cancer. Happily enough, the sequence of the splice variant is conserved between man and mouse. It's 100% identical. So a nanobody that recognizes this particular splice variant in the preclinical mouse models could be transposed to the human setting as well. I pointed out at the outset that uh, nanobodies are poorly immunogenic owing to their strong sequence similarity with the VH3 family of human immunoglobulin variable regions. And this is why we think that the next step in this, uh, in this journey will surely consist of converting this particular nanobody into an imaging agent, if not a therapeutic entity, that could be useful for uh, pancreatic cancer and other uh, epithelial tumors. So I repeat this one slide here. If we now equip our anti-kappa nanobodies with agents that selectively detect tumors, such as the E3B splice variant of fibronectin, we might be able to direct immune cells to the tumor. We could validate that by visualizing exactly what happens using either PET imaging experiments that visualize neutrophils, PET imaging experiments that visualize CDA T cells, and so forth. And so uh, in closing, um, I hope I've convinced you that these nanobodies are remarkable tools from a biochemical perspective, uh, ease of production, ease of modification. I've shown you in a number of preclinical settings that these nanobodies can be useful not only to diagnose ongoing immune responses, but to intervene in the outcome of immune responses, both in a tolerogenic setting and in an immunogenic setting. I've shown you that these nanobodies are in fact ideal vehicles to construct antibody drug conjugates, uh, one of the most active areas in, in biotechnology, with a significant advantage of site-specific modification. And then in closing, like I said, I believe that some of the nanobodies currently in hand will prove to be useful for diagnosis and treatment of cancers, including pancreatic cancer. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Questions? Fatima. Dr. Fatima Carboz. Thank you very much. It was an excellent talk. So in cancer therapy, there is a new uh, class of agents that we call antibody drug conjugates. And they are uh, being active and used in many types of cancer. One of the problems is because the transporter is an antibody, is the size. And for example, if we want to use them to prevent brain metastasis, it is a problem because they don't easily cross the blood-brain barrier, particularly if it is intact. So do you think one of the future applications could be to use the nanobodies to uh, conjugate them with a drug, cytotoxic drug, and to use that as a therapeutic uh, uh, strategy? And linked to that is, is there any toxicity associated with the nanobody itself, or in those circumstances, we would only have 
to care about the toxicity of the cytotoxic. So two questions. So the first one, the, the antibody drug conjugates, uh, the nanobody dexamethasone adduct is an example of a nanobody drug adduct. The problem that you mentioned, the poor penetration of intact immunoglobulins and delivery across the blood-brain barrier, is something that we're currently addressing. So there are nanobodies that recognize the transferrin receptor. The transferrin receptor spontaneously transcytosis across the choroid plexus and the endothelium that separates the blood from the brain parenchyma. And we can show, again, by, by positron emission tomography that these transferrin receptor-specific nanobodies do reach the brain. So we can exploit transferrin receptor-specific nanobodies to get drugs across the blood-brain barrier. It may even be possible to make fusions of antitransferrin receptor nanobodies with nanobodies that recognize specific cell types, like glial cells or uh, astrocytes, and achieve even greater degrees of specificity. So this is a very active area of, of research, and we're certainly not the only ones involved in that work. Uh, but I think the signs are quite encouraging. We have a, an antibody against glial fibrillary acidic protein, and if injected at high doses, uh, that nanobody will penetrate the blood-brain barrier. As to the toxicities, uh, we have not found any toxicity associated with administration of a nanobody per se. We can make immunotoxins, for example, with uh, some of the bacterial toxins conjugated to nanobodies that target neutrophils, and we can use those strategies to deplete in vivo cell populations of interest, as I've shown for the class two specific uh, example. So, I don't think that toxicity is necessarily a dose-limiting factor. Some individuals have pre-existing circulating antibodies against nanobodies, strangely enough, and where they come from, nobody knows. So I think it would be important, you know, prior to first in human trials, to assess whether or not a, an individual has pre-existing circulating antibodies. Uh, but as I've said, you know, the Belgians have launched a company called AppLynx, acquired for $2 billion by Sanofi, and they have one product in the clinic uh, for uh, treatment of a clotting disorder. These are nanobodies specific for Van, Vil Van Villebrand factor. So I, I think um, if it can be done with full-sized immunoglobulins, it can usually be done better with nanobodies. Thank you uh, for your wonderful work and the lecture today. Um, in the development of monoclonal antibodies, um, new drugs have been created that are T-cell engager, B-specific antibodies. Uh, we know that with the nanobodies, we can recruit polyclonal antibodies and create or enhance uh, ADCC, ADCP, right. activation of NK. Uh, do you think that is possible also to engage your CD3 on yes. T cells and even recreate with a better penetration what uh, T cell engagers have been? Yeah, there are CD3 epsilon specific nanobodies that are used for exactly the same purpose of the popular single chain FVs. The nice thing, again, about these nanobodies, and uh, we, I can talk for the next half hour about the biochemistry there, but they do not require glycosylation. They do not require disulfide bonds. They can be made by fermentation quite easily. And so some of the production uh, issues associated with making bites can be avoided if you shift to a nanobody-based platform. Uh, I didn't have the time to go into this, but you can use them as building blocks for chimeric antigen receptors. And again, you know, they are uh, superior in many ways to the single-chain FV format because the nanobody evolved to negotiate the secretory pathway without the benefit of a light chain. So these things were pre-designed, if you will, to serve as standalone units. And this allows one to make T cells that not only produce a nanobody-based car, but also T cells that in addition to making a car secrete nanobodies, for example, that block CD47. So we've shown that if you block this don't eat me signal, by having a CAR T cell secrete an antibody specific for CD47, it dramatically potentiates the anti-tumor effect. So there's uh, CAR macrophages, the same idea. You can build macrophages that have CARs, 
and um, equip them with um, signaling domains that activate the inflammatory cascade in the macrophage, resulting in increased release of proteases that might degrade extracellular matrix of tumors and so forth. So this, is, this area is exploding as we speak. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. So uh, we all know that uh, patients that get uh, monoclonal antibodies to cytokines, for example, chronically for the treatment of some autoimmune condition, uh, a, a considerable fraction of those patients, varying from 10 to 40 percent, develop anti-drug antibodies, as they call them. Um, these antibodies appear to be always against the variable region, not against the concentrations of the injected therapeutic antibodies. So although I take you face value that is less likely to make anti-drug antibodies to nanobodies than to conventional antibodies, because it's variable region in any case, maybe there are some. You just yeah. told me or told us that there are some individuals that already. Right. So I, I think it would be good to have those experiments done. To, we, we, to we, know. We, we did look at this. And so in, in inbred B6 mice, so, so we, most of our animals are done in, in the B6 uh, background, we, we measure the presence of antibodies in the circulation after repeated administration of nanobodies. And about 25% of the animals develop antibodies readily detectable by immunoblot and ELISA. 25% questionable and 50% we never see any antibodies at all. And, if you think about it, you know, the, the B cell repertoire in the B6 mouse is stochastically assembled. And so maybe some animals don't have the B cells capable of making an anti nanobody response, and others do. So th those are the numbers 25%, nice. a decent response, 25% so so, and then 50% none at all. Yeah. By the way, for, for just for the audience, um, I was surprised to, uh, to learn that. Uh, in, in many clinical instances, um, if, if the therapeutic antibody uh, s ceases to have a marked effect, uh, and the reason is the existence of anti-drug antibodies, the clinician usually raises the dose in the hope that that will solve the problem. It won't solve the problem. You have to change the drug. To change for another monoclonal antibody with a different variable region is the only way out. So along those lines, I mean, we have not found any relationship between uh, animals producing antibodies against the nanobody and the therapeutic efficacy that we see. Okay. Oh, so. I see. Interesting. So they may carry them. Yeah. Okay. Yes, there is one there. Maybe throw it. Uh, hello. So first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Beautiful work. Uh, my current question is, uh, you talked a lot about the advantages and these wonderful uh, applications and of these nanobodies. And so what are the current disadvantages or roadblocks that you and your team or other teams that are utilizing these nanobodies are facing? Very fair question. So the, the, uh, there are two sides to, to the story, I think. One is, if one thinks of chemically modifying a protein, uh, big pharma will insist on chemistries like malayamide chemistry, NHS chemistry. Why? Because that's what was historically used. That is what the FDA and the USA has commonly approved. And so some of the enzymatic methods that we've developed have yet to pass through regulatory hurdles. This means we would have to, we have to manufacture the enzymes under GMP conditions and uh, all of the reactants that go into making these nanobody drug additives would likewise have to be made under GMP conditions. Uh, an academic lab typically lacks the resources to, to do that. So um, there are biotech companies tentatively pursuing that. So that's obviously one drawback, that the precision with which we can modify these nanobodies requires methods that have not been approved for use in the clinic. That's step one. The second is the manufacture of the nanobodies themselves. Uh, I think that's a hurdle that has been taken by Sanofi and by Ablinks. So they can manufacture 
nanobodies under GMP conditions suitable for use in humans. And again, most academic labs uh, are not in a position to do that. So those are two hurdles. And the third one is immunogenicity. So there are a few residues in the framework of these nanobodies that, when mutated, dramatically reduce immunogenicity. None of the nanobodies that we have used make use of those mutations. But the ones that are being considered for use in the clinic all have these framework mutations for the specific purpose of reducing immunogenicity. And as Antonio has pointed out, that is no assurance that you would not see an immune response. Uh, the, uh, an anti-idiotypic response directed against the CDRs of these nanobodies is entirely plausible and probably will occur. Uh, but in that sense, it's no different from therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. So those, those are the three main, main factors. Um, lack of approval of the modification strategies, uh, lack of approval of manufacturing large quantities of the nanobodies themselves, and the unavoidable immunogenicity issue. One more. One more. For how long these nanobodies stay, and can you reboost by injecting them in in the bodies of the animals? For how I, I long didn't get, I didn't get stay? The first, I didn't get the first part of the question. Uh, for how long do they stay um, ah, in the body? So this is this is. This is exactly the parameter that controls whether or not you can use these things as imaging agents. So many clinicians have tried to use zirconium-labeled full-sized immunoglobulins for imaging purposes. And this is a problem because you, know, you inject the patient with a large amount of zirconium-labeled immunoglobulin, and then that patient will have to wait three, four, five days before you can image because of the inability of the antibody to penetrate the relevant tissues. So this means the patient either is sent home with a lot of radioactivity in the circulation, or you have to sequester them in the hospital until you can do imaging. So this is why the F18 method is so valuable, potentially, because this would allow same-day imaging, uh, half-life of 110 minutes, so you image in the morning, and by the end of the day, the patient can go home without residual radioactivity. The circulatory half-life of an antibody is 30 minutes. Uh, in mice. But you can tune the circulatory half-life by modification with polyethylene glycol or by hooking it up to an antibody that binds to a serum protein like albumin. So the drug that's approved for use in humans consists of an antibody that recognizes von Willebrand factor fused to an antibody that recognizes serum albumin. So the half-life of the fusion then becomes identical to the half-life of serum albumin, which is measured in weeks. So it, it's, uh, that, this is the beauty of, of nanobodies. You can essentially tune the half-life of the therapeutic or diagnostic in accordance with what you want it to do. Thank you. Other questions? Now, uh, he has already some people to talk to, but those who want to talk to him, please show up at the uh, Direção Clinica, where we'll be. So, thanks very much, Hida. It was a pleasure to listen to you.
Shutterstock Music. Shut up, 